Christ I stand with much fear and much trembling. <laughs> but I don't come to impress nor to entertain but simply to share what God is doing in and through a ministry called the Gideons International. So thank you uh, for allowing us to come again. I feel like this is my second church home, and I always look forward to coming. When I walked through the doors this morning, I was hearing a beautiful Christmas carol being sung, and when I swung into those doors there and looked around the sanctuary, I realized that another year has come and gone. Another year with all of the promises and all the things that God has been doing has come and gone, and it's been so good. So happy Thanksgiving. Merry Christmas. Are you going to have Christmas, or are you going to miss Christmas? A lot of people are going to miss Christmas this year, as they have so many other years. But I pray that you will not miss Christmas. I, some of you know and some of you do not know, but I'm still... I'm still doing what I've done over 40 years now. I'm an automobile auctioneer, and I travel from one auction to another auction and to another city, and every day I'm in another city and another place. And I've done that for over 40 years now, and it's been an exciting career, and I've enjoyed it. But this one Wednesday morning, I pulled into the parking lot at Harrisonburg Auto Auction. As I pulled into the parking lot, there it sat. An ambulance was sitting at the front door, and it had its doors open and the lights were on and there was people moving about. And I parked my car, walked on through the lobby of that business and as I walked through the lobby, I looked at one of the secretaries and I said, what's happening? She says, Jim has had a heart attack. He's laying in lane one out there in the floor and they're, they're trying to revive him. It doesn't look good. I walked on through the crowd and as I, as I separated the crowd and walked up, I stood right over top of where the EMTs were working on this man that I've known for many years. I watched them as they worked on him, and the one EMT looked, and he says, I've got nothing. So finally, they had to go to the paddles, the last thing. And so they said clear, and they hit, hit him with the electricity and those paddles, and he come up off the floor, and he said, I've got, I've got something. And all of a sudden, you saw the monitor come back, and life had come back into his body. They worked on him a little bit more, and they worked, and they worked frantically. And finally, the one EMT says to the other, we, I think he's good enough to transport now. Just as they picked him up off the floor, <clears throat> his eyes opened. He looked straight into my eyes. And he looked into my eyes. He had such a sense of peace about it. And my mind drifted back two weeks prior to that moment that I stood looking into my friend's eyes. Two weeks prior to that day, 20 feet from where he lays on the floor now, 20 feet and two weeks prior, I opened the Word of God up and asked him the most important question anybody will ever ask anybody, including you. I said, Jim... He was telling me how he hadn't been feeling good, been going to the doctor, and uh, he's getting up in years. And I said, Jim, let me ask you the most important question. From zero to 100%, how sure are you that if you die today that you're on your way to a place called heaven to spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, everybody wants to go to heaven, don't they? I think they do. But he looked at me and he said, Ted, I don't know. I can't give you, I can't give you a 100% answer. He said, I, I want to go to heaven, but I don't think that I've, I've been a, that good a man. I said, Jim, we've not, any of us, been good, good enough to get there on our own. And I said, Jim, could I take the word of God, not what I say, but what the word of God says, and if I could take the word of God and show you how you can be 100% sure that you're on your way to heaven, when you draw your last breath, I had no idea it would come this early. And I opened the word of God, and people were coming and going, and there's a lot of people in these places. And you know, when you open up the word of God, things happen, don't you? When you mention the name above all names, the Lord Jesus Christ let me tell you something. You're going to get reactions. And when you open up the Word of God in the public marketplace, 
you're also going to get reaction. Because people step off to the side. It makes them uncomfortable. Why does it make them uncomfortable? When you name the name of Jesus, why does it make people uncomfortable when you open up the greatest book that's ever been known to mankind? This is the only book that can transform for all of eternity. This is not some help book on the bestseller, 10 national bestsellers. No, this is the greatest book of all time. This could change you for eternity and transform your soul for eternity. Now we're standing in a, busy, a very busy place and people are going and coming. And now people, as they walk by, sort of slow down when you open up the Word of God to see what's been or what is being said as they do one of these. You know what I'm saying. And I said, Jim, you said you've not been everything you should be. But God already knows that. And it's the same with us here this morning, beloved. Listen to me. God already knows that. The Word of God says in John 3, 16, that God loves you. Do you know this morning that God loves you? Look around this. Look around this sanctuary. Don't you understand that? Don't you understand the greatest gift that's ever been given to mankind? Are you going to miss the gift or have you received the gift? That's the only way you'll have Christmas, beloved, is that if you receive that greatest gift. I said, Jim, do you know that God loves you? I think so, he said. And I said, according to the word of God in John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus, that whosoever, Jim, that's you, that's me, that's all these people that are walking through here, and are stopping and slowing down and looking and seeing what's being said. But, beloved, listen to me. Aren't you glad that God seemed fit through the power of the Holy Spirit to put whosoever in the Word of God? Aren't you? Listen, beloved. I have it on good authority that it's all right to nod in approval. It's all right to say amen in God's house. That nothing will happen and the roof tiles won't fall in and this ceiling will still remain when we depart this afternoon. But aren't you glad the Holy Spirit put whosoever in the Word of God? Amen. You know, I'm standing here this morning on this platform with my knees knocking and trembling, but the fact of the matter is you're looking at one of those whosoevers, and I'm looking back into the eyes and the faces of a lot of whosoevers. I'm so thankful for that one word, whosoever. Believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you. God loves you because, as Dr. Sizemore said to first service, you are important. Had you been the only one, he would have come and hung on the cross of Calvary. You are important, but more importantly, you are precious, beloved. Just like Dr. Sizemore said this morning, you're precious. Why in the world would he allow his son to hang on the cross because of you or me? You'd have to be awfully precious, wouldn't you? And Jim and I are standing there reading the Word of God. Beloved, I found over the years as my hair turns white and I, I grow a whole lot older, this is a powerful book. And every time you open it up, the author shows up, speaks to people's hearts. It's not what I say. It's not what you say. It's what the Word of God says, and he speaks words into their lives that you would never be able to do. All you have to do is let them read the Word of God or read the Word of God to them. And I said, aren't you glad that he loves you, Jim? He said, I sure am. I said, but there's a problem, Jim. And I said, listen, the word of God also says in Romans, for all, for all, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I said, Jim, have you ever sinned? He said, Ted, more than I care to, more than I care to tell you about. He said, it'd be embarrassing for you to know. But it'd be embarrassing for, for you to know my sins if they were written on these white walls here this morning. Oh, we dress up and we come to church in our best. And we look the best we're probably going to look all week. But the fact of the matter is we'd all be terribly embarrassed if they were written in red on these white walls, would we not? Just like Jim. I'd be embarrassed. But I said, Jim... It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
So you know that God loves you and you know that you're a sinner. You've already admitted that. But it also says, for the wages of sin is death. Some swinging glass doors there in that lane where we were standing. And I said, you see those doors? I said, they keep us from inside that lobby. Keeps all of these people from inside that lobby until they open that door and gain access. That's the way your sin does between you and a holy and righteous God. For it says, for the wages of sin is death. And that word death, beloved, means separation from God. It's for the wages of sin. What we earn, what we receive for our sin is death, separation from God. And I said, just like those doors. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I said, in just a second, Jim, I'm going to close this little testament, and I'm going to hand the word of God to you just like this. You know, you're over 21 years old. You can accept it with your hands, or you can reject it. And you can tell me like so many people do that I meet throughout the world, no, I'm good, man. How many times have you heard that? Well, how good are you? Are you good to get to heaven? Not on your own, you're not. Beloved, I'm not, I'm not passing judgment. I'm just responding the way the Word of God says. So Jim's here, and now Jim's really tore up because it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I said, Jim, it's a gift, but you've got to receive it. This you'll receive with your hands, but the gift of eternal life, the gift of salvation, you must receive it with your heart. He said, I'd like that. And I said, read the last verse for me, Jim. Just read that last verse. And he looked at it and he says, for whosoever, there's that word again, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? It's okay, remember what I said. And it, and sometimes, sometimes the best you can do is just barely give it that little nod, you know. You don't want th- people to think, you know, you've gone charismatic or something. You know, he said, one, one of those things, you know. <laughs> but it's all right. So I said, Jim, read that last. He wiped the tears out of his eyes. And he said, for whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And beloved, let me ask you a question. Like I asked Jim, standing there in that busy, busy auction it's loud. Now me and him was talking loud. It shall be saved a 25% promise in the word of God or a 100% promise. They're getting better, Willard. They're getting a lot better. Now, that was participation there, wasn't it? Nobody got hurt. We're not going to have to call an ambulance on that one. It's 100% promise in the word of God, and don't you ever miss it. For whosoever calls, that means to pray and to ask, upon the name of the Lord shall be be saved and that is one of the sweetest promises in all the word of God I've seen hundreds and thousands of people come to Christ upon that passage of scripture right there and and he said Ted I want that right there in that busy lane and the auction starting up over the other lane it's loud put my arm over his shoulder pull him in good and close Jim prayed and asked Christ to receive Come into his heart, be his savior, to be his Lord, save him from his sins so that he could know he's on his way to heaven. He hugged me, and I hugged him right there in the lane. People look, and they're like, what in the world's going on with these guys? You know, what, what's happening here? You know, the world is confused and puzzled when God's at work sometimes. <clears throat> Little did he know that two weeks after that moment that he gave his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, They'd be loading him into an ambulance, holding on, just barely holding on by one heartbeat and waiting on the next one to come. But guess what? I don't care how old you are this morning. I don't care how young you are this morning. You're the same way. If it does not come, that next beat, then where would you spend eternity? Beloved, if your next breath didn't come, where would you spend all of eternity? Because you're going to spend eternity in one of two places. Does that sound harsh to you? Does that, that, that's, that's the truth. That's the word of God. You know, Jesus spoke two times more about a place called hell than he did a place called heaven. Because he didn't want you to go there. That's why he hung on the cross of Calvary. 
So now Jim is on his way to the hospital. I'm praying for him, and I, I walked him all the way to the, to the ambulance. And as they pulled him up close to that ambulance, he opened his eyes, and he smiled at me. And they pushed that gurney into that ambulance and slammed the back door, and I prayed. I prayed for Jim to survive that heart attack. He survived that heart attack. I was at the hospital later on that afternoon. He's in ICU. He stayed in ICU for a while. Six weeks later, he walked into the auction sale, the same auction sale he had passed out in. He walked up in front of the block with a smile upon his face, looking like a million bucks. He says, <laughs> he said, we made it. We made it. I said, I'll be down in just a second. Went on my break, got off, walked around there. We walked outside. He said, Ted, first place I wanted to come was here. I wanted to tell you that I laid there as they were working on me with the greatest sense of peace that I've ever known in all my life. At 72 years old, I've never known peace like I knew laying there in that floor on a cold, hard concrete floor. EMT's working on me, and it's, pretty, it's a pretty frantic scene. But he says, I had a sense of peace, and it all went back to two weeks before. When you loved me enough and cared enough about me to share the Lord Jesus Christ with me, I want you to know I've told my pastor, and I was baptized two weeks ago, and he says, I have a great sense of peace that everything's okay in my life. Six months later, second heart attack took him on to glory. My friend Jim is in a place called glory, not because of what I did, but because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did on a place called Calvary. As he hung on that cross, he said, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Why in the world would you wait? Why in the world would you wait? Beloved, I'm here on behalf of Gideon's International this morning. You say, well, who in the world are the Gideons? Well, I'm glad you asked. Gideon's International is an association of Christian business and professional men banded together in 1899 for one purpose and one purpose only. is to lead men and women, boys and girls, to the Lord Jesus Christ all over the world. And we do it in two ways. By the placement of God's word into the busy highways and byways and traffic lanes of life as we place those Bibles into the hotel rooms those Bibles into the hospital rooms, those Bibles into the jail cells and the prisons. And then we place those little testaments into the college campuses. Some schools, very few now, will allow us into their classrooms. And we place them all over the world into those classrooms. So, beloved, I'm here to say on behalf of the Gideons International, for all those many years, We've only had one purpose. It's to lead men and women, boys and girls to Jesus Christ. We do it in two ways, by the placement of God's word or through personal witnessing as we travel about in our daily lives. And there's where I love, I love what God is doing in and through the use of his word. Very seldom will you ever catch me without a copy of God's word. And if you do catch me without it, it's because I've given it to somebody. And so I try to keep one on me at all times. But sometimes I get caught without one. I was on my way to Columbus, Ohio back in July, and I had my business partner with me, and he hasn't been able to travel in quite some time. He's uh, recovering from bone cancer. He had stage 4 bone cancer. He's in full remission, doing very well. So we're on our way to a the National Car Show in Columbus, Ohio. We had a trailer behind the truck, and we're rolling through, and we'd hit a hard storm over in West Virginia. Come off the turnpike, and, I mean, it was just so rough over there, I said, I better stop and check the load. Pulled in the, tr the truck, uh, the, uh, the rest area over on uh, I-70, just as you go across the Ohio state line. I pulled in with all the tractor and trailers over there, and Mike said, I've got to get out. I'm hurting so bad, and he got out, and he started walking around, and I walked, you know, unlocked the door of the trailer, got in, checked everything, got back out, and there he stood. He's checking all of his tires on this tractor and trailer, just sitting right beside me. And as he's checking the tires, I looked at him, I said, uh, 
well, how in the world are you doing? And it kind of shocked him. You know, people, people they, they just don't expect you to talk to them, I don't think. You know, it's like, I'm going to do my thing and you do yours. But I like to talk to people. I guess you've got that idea, you know. <laughs> but I do, I, I, I just like people. I enjoy talking with people. I enjoy sharing with people. And I uh, said, so, well, so where are you headed? He said, I'm headed to Cincinnati. He said, I make this run three times a week, Cincinnati. I said, well, man, that's great. I said, what's your name? He said, Craig. I said, well, Craig, let me ask you something. You get back in that rig, you're pulling 40-some thousand pounds, you roll out down the road, somebody pulls in front of you down the road, it's just you head towards Cincinnati. On the road to Cincinnati, you meet death and destruction. Truck turns over, takes your life, then where are you going to spend eternity? He said, man, who are you? I get to that. People ask me that all the time. They say, man, who are you? I said, I'm just a man on my way to Columbus, Ohio. I'm going to play all weekend long. And uh, got that old car right there, and we're just going to play. Me and my partner right there. I said, he hadn't been out in a long time. And I said, that's my business partner. And I said, he's looked death in the eye. But let me tell you something. That man right there knows exactly where he's going. He loves the Lord Jesus Christ. But, Craig, let me ask you something. If that truck turns over, catches a fire, you perish in that truck this afternoon on the way to Cincinnati. How sure are you from zero to 100% that you're on your way to heaven this afternoon on the road to Cincinnati? He said, man, I'm not sure at all, but man, this is strange, he said. <laughs> he said, I've been thinking about these matters. Do you think, for a, you think for a second, church, listen to me, do you think for a second that God who sits upon the throne in all of his sovereignty. Do you think it was an accident that I pulled in beside Craig's church, I mean, not his church, but his truck, and that he's been thinking of these things? No, God wanted to speak a word into his life. I said, well, Craig, let me ask you, would you allow me to open the word of God and share with you how you can know you'd be 100% sure? Just like my friend that laid on the floor, had a heart attack, and like hundreds of others, I opened the word of God right there at the truck stop at the rest area. My friend come back over. He's praying, and I'm opening the word of God, and the Holy Spirit of God is touching a truck driver's heart. In less than five minutes, I watched Craig as the Holy Spirit of God softened his heart and spoke a word into his life bowed his head between those trucks over there. Trucks coming and going down the interstate. It's loud. Three men holding on to each other. One of those holy huddles. And I watched Craig bow his head, surrender his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he's 100% sure that he's on the road to a place called heaven and not only on the road to a place called Cincinnati. Beloved, I came into this ministry a long time ago. And why do I go and why do I stay on the road so much? It's because God loved me enough to save my soul. Because one night on a college campus, a man in a navy blue suit and a red tie stood at the top of the stairs. And he said, sir, excuse me, could I give you a copy of the word of God? I'd love to tell you, fair of you, that I was out that night looking for a copy of the Word of God. <laughs> but I wasn't. I knew who Jesus was. I knew all about Jesus. I sang the songs in church as a little boy. My mom and daddy took all five of us children to church every Sunday. I knew as I sat in Miss Pratt's Sunday school class, I knew who Jesus was. I knew that Jesus hung on the cross for my sins. I knew all about those things. I knew what Easter was. I knew what Christmas was all about. The fact of the matter is, I did not know Jesus. And that man handed me that copy of the Word of God. He said to me, take it. It'll do you good. And then he said those words, it always makes a difference. Anywhere in the world, in any language, I've been all over the world, but the fact of the matter is, it's always that one word that makes a difference in any language, any part of the world, no matter where you're from, it's free. 
Well, thank you very much. And I put it down in my pocket, went to class, didn't look at it for another eight years. I'd love to tell you that I just read it, was gloriously saved that night, but I wasn't. I, say, I read it, I carried it for eight years, never opened it up. But my little wife back at home, my high school sweetheart, got saved when she was 15 years old watching the Billy Graham crusade. I've told you that before. She's praying for a lost husband out there on the road, running with a pretty fast crowd, looking for one thing, and that was success. Success did come, but what is success? Beloved, let me tell you something. You can have all the stuff you want to, but there's always going to be a hole in your heart, a hole in your life, that nothing, things, stuff, people, power, money, it don't matter. Jobs will never fill that emptiness in your heart. Trust me, I know all about it. In March 1981, God got a hold of my heart, and little did I, I didn't want anybody to know I'd been reading that little testament for over a year. She's praying for me. A church is praying for me. And when you get a church and a godly wife praying for you, let me tell you something. The hound of heaven is on your heels, and you will not shake him. I don't care. You can run as fast as you can run, and you can't hide. But the hound of heaven will hound you from now on. And he was on my heels. I'd lay in those empty hotel rooms, and I'd read the Word of God. I'd go from great heights of comfort to the very depths of despair as I'd throw that little testament across those hotel rooms. Finally, in March of 81, God got a hold of my heart, and I surrendered my life, my heart, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I prayed that prayer, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I'm a sinner. Come into my heart and be my Savior and be my Lord. And I asked him to save me, and I promised him I'd serve him all the days of my life. That was in March of 1981, before some of y'all even thought about it. March of 91, God called me to this ministry called the Gideons International. Little did I know that when I prayed that prayer that night to receive Jesus Christ, that God was going to put me into that same ministry. God was going to allow me to go all over the world, from the jungles of Africa to the tip of South America, all through Latin America, and every major city in the United States, and all through Europe. All for one purpose. It's a pretty simple mission. I don't mind telling you. Do you know that God loves you? Do you know that God loves you? Can I give you a copy of the Word of God? Let me show you what He says. Let me show you. God's Word says in Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. I was standing on the sidewalk in front of the economics department in Buenos Aires, Argentina. The road was six lanes, three on each side, the buses and the people, and they were coming up out of the subways, and it was so loud you could hardly hear anything going on. And I was offering each one of those economic students a copy of the Word of God. And I looked, and as far from here to those back doors, there she stood. She's holding a bicycle, but she's holding something else, and she held it up, and she's going... I said, come over here. The people were so thick on the sidewalk she couldn't get through. My interpreter, I said, Sam, his name was Samuel, but he said, just call me Sam. I said, Sam, go over there and tell that woman, try to make her way through here and help her with that bicycle. Something's going on. She's got one of those little blue testaments. Make her way through here. She made her way through, and he, she came right to me. Through my interpreter, she says these words. Four blocks from here, I'm riding my bicycle, and I look into a trash can, and there it laid, the Word of God. And she said, I reached down and picked up the little blue book because it was brand new. And I thought, why would anybody throw a brand new little notebook away? She took it, and she opened it, and she said, what is this? Everybody in the world don't understand and know what the Word of God is, beloved. She said, can you tell me about this book? I said, I can. I opened up the Word of God. For God so loved the world, and I let her read it, that he gave his only begotten son. And I watched the Holy Spirit of God begin to move into this young woman's heart. 
And I watched as I watched hundreds and even thousands of people the same thing. She got to the very end. For whosoever, there it is, whosoever, Argentina, Mozambique, it doesn't matter. Beloved, I believe if you could have seen, if you could see that testament that that young woman was holding through the eyes of God, you could see your fingerprints all over that little testament. You'd see your fingerprints all over it. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. She bowed her head in that busy. We were, we were right here just like this, and the subway, people were pouring out of the subways, and the traffic was going by. And in all that noise and all that confusion, she met the Prince of Peace, and his name is Jesus. During this Christmas season, will you have Christmas, or will you miss the Prince of Peace that was born into that stable in Bethlehem? I pray that you'll not miss Christmas. I want to close with this. Willard, there's not a clock. This is like being in Las Vegas. <laughs> I bet y'all never thought you'd hear that in a church, did you? <laughs> Last time I was in Las Vegas, by the way, I have been to Vegas. I've been to Vegas several times, and there's only one reason I'll go. I don't go for the lights. I don't go for the shows. I don't go for the food. I don't go for the gambling. But I will go when my Lord calls me to that place, and it makes me sick when they advertise that place. What happens here stays here. Big deal. I don't have nothing to hide. Last time the Lord called me to Vegas, we put 205,000 copies of God's Word into Las Vegas in five days. And listen to me, Fairview, you were right there. 205,000 copies of God's Word into Las Vegas. So, beloved, that's the reason I know there's no clocks out there because they just, I don't know, they just don't want you to have any sense of time. Let me, uh, let me close. The reason I said that, Willard, I'm not sure what time I'm supposed to land this big plane. <laughs> we are? I got 1030. I got all day. Lord gave, Lord gave me a good mom and a good daddy. I'm the oldest boy. There's two boys and three girls. Boy, he gave us good parents. He gave us a, just a great dad. Taught us a lot of life lessons. Taught us how to work hard and a good work ethic. Four years ago, I watched my daddy draw his last breath as he suffered from uh, asbestos when we were there at the family home. And I watched my daddy gasping for air. And just he and I in, in his bedroom there. And I watched, him, I watched him take his last breath. And I watched him leave to go home. You see, I had such a sense of peace and comfort about it. I, I got up from where I was at in that Queen Anne chair watching my daddy take those shallow breaths. And I got up from that Queen Anne chair and I walked over to that oxygen. After I checked my dad, there was no heartbeat and no breath. I kissed my dad on the forehead. And I said, breathe, dad. I said, breathe. I said, breathe, daddy. I said, that's heavenly air now. And I said, you don't need this. And I turned off the oxygen machine. It had been running for five and a half years. You don't know what I'm talking about unless you've heard it run. Five and a half years, I listened to it as I go visit my mom and daddy. He had to have it to live. And I said, breathe, daddy. Breathe that heavenly air. And I said, daddy, I'll be me and Mama, the girls, David, we'll all be along very shortly. I said, go home, Daddy, and rest. You fought a good fight. You've been a good dad. You taught me a lot of life's lessons, how to treat people right, how to love people, how to take care of your family. You'd be a good husband, be a good father. I said, you go home, Daddy. Well, let me tell you something. Flowers will wither and the flowers will die. But the word of God will endure forever. Hanging right there on the wall as you walk down this little hallway right here. I just want to explain something to you as a lesson. But as you walk down this little hallway right here, just on that, on that hall 
wall right there hanging is a lot of little cards in there, and you've walked by them many, many times, but it doesn't really mean a whole lot to you. But let me, let me bring it on down to the small end of the funnel. Let me bring it down small end of the funnel for you. After my daddy went home to be with the Lord, there for weeks, I'd walk down to the mailbox. I'd open up that mailbox. I'd reach in, and I'd pull out those cards. And those cards would say, in memory. And then I'd open them up, and they'd have some most precious notes about my daddy to me. What my daddy had meant to him, how my daddy had... Uh, taking good care of some people that I didn't know about. But they knew I loved the Lord. They knew that, that by placing Bibles in memory of my daddy, somewhere out there in those 200 countries around the world as we placed 82 million copies last year, they knew that that's where my heart was. So they placed Bibles in memory of my daddy. Well, I'd go down to the mailbox every day, and I'd read notes and sit, sit and cry. Tears of joy about the effects of my daddy's life upon many. But I want you to know the word of God says, even though he is dead, yet he still speaketh. Because somewhere in the world, Bibles were placed in a hotel room when somebody needed it. On a college campus to a young man that did not know Jesus. In a jail cell to somebody that needed Jesus badly in a hospital room to offer comfort during times that they needed comfort. Then 14 months later, my little mama sat down at my sister's breakfast table, and uh, she drawed her last breath and went home to be with Jesus. Both my mama and my daddy knew the Lord and loved the Lord. I had the privilege of having the funeral for both my mama and my daddy. I, I did that with great calmness and assurance because I knew where my mama and daddy are. But here's what I want to say to you. The greatest gift that I know, apart from my mom and daddy, was this. Every day that I went to the mailbox, there was an in-memory card, and Bibles were placed in memory of my mama and my daddy with a very precious note inside about how my mom and daddy had affected their lives. 1,860 Bibles were given in honor of my mom and daddy. Do you realize that for every one of these Bibles that is placed in a hotel room, we understand has the potential of touching 2,300 lives? Do you know that? Each one of these Bibles is $5, and it lays in a hotel room, and in six years' time, has potential of touching 2,300 lives. Now, we know that all those are not going to come to Jesus. We know that all of them aren't. But we also know that some may have checked into that hotel with the intentions of it being their last night here upon this earth. Like a very good friend of mine, Elliot Oshowitz, checked in a hotel one night. You're going to end it all. Had it not been for that hotel Bible that somebody like you purchased and gave, put in that hotel, he would have ended it. Elliot, a Jew at that time, gave his heart to Jesus and became a pastor at Jefferson, North Carolina, of a very good church. He just retired two months ago. Who was it that purchased the Bible? I don't know. But maybe it's one of those Bibles that were given in memory of my mom and my daddy. 